My name is Leon Miauser. Welcome to War of the Rebellion, Stories of the Civil War, where I'm reading regimental histories written by the veterans of the American Civil War. And I've got an absolutely excellent book. We're going to be reading number one, finally here in the witching hour to get my good recording time. And the... Regimental history we're going to be reading is Under the Maltese Cross, Antietam to Appomattox, The Loyal Uprising in Western Pennsylvania from 1861 to 1865, Campaign's 155th Pennsylvania Regiment, narrated by the rank and file, published by the 155th Regimental Association, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 1910. Preface the Peninsula Campaign is a failure. The Union arms have not been victorious. They have been driven back to the gates of Washington, notwithstanding all reports to the contrary. Had it not been for these fateful words, just quoted, uttered by Governor Andrew G. Curtin at a Great War mass meeting held on the West Common, Allegheny, Pennsylvania, on the 24th day of July, 1862, the history of the 155th Pennsylvania Volunteers would probably never have been written. Up to that period, the attempted secession of the southern states had been the all-absorbing subject of public interest. But the real magnitude of the war for the Union had not been fully realized by the people of western Pennsylvania. It was felt somehow that with the mighty efforts already put forth by the national government, the rebellion must be short-lived and the national authority soon restored throughout the South. The solemn and impressive declaration of the chief executive of the great Commonwealth of Pennsylvania that the war thus far had been a failure awoke the people with a shock to the real danger of the situation. The effect of the governor's words was not discouraging. They simply aroused the people from the sense of false security under which they had hitherto been resting and stirred up all the latent patriotism in their hearts, resulting in a firm determination that the war henceforth should be waged relentlessly till the last armed foe to the Union should ground his arms. Many youths who had never hitherto entertained a thought of enlisting suddenly felt themselves impelled to enroll themselves in defense of the integrity of their native land, and thus it happened that the 155th came into existence. The itinerary and narrative in the following pages is but a record mainly of the rank and file of the regiment, their hardships and suffering, their sacrifices of life, limb, and health in behalf of their beloved country. The opening chapter begins with the firing of Sumpner, the official date of the beginning of the Civil War, and portrays the state of the public mind which called forth upon the stage of action the patriotic devotion to the Union and of so many heroic men and women in western Pennsylvania. Their acts and sacrifices speak for themselves in the following pages. The authors of this history mostly belonged to the rank and file of the regiment and they have carefully avoided censorious criticisms, being content simply to narrate the story of the stirring events of the campaign under the Maltese Cross, the badge of the 5th Corps, Army of the Potomac, compiled from records, diaries, home letters, and narratives of actual participants, and leaving the reader his prerogative of passing the same. The numerous wartime illustrations and photo groups of reunions and monument dedications appearing in the volume is somewhat of an innovation, which with the passage of time will greatly enhance the work as an illustrated souvenir history of the greatest war of modern times. The comrade authors are pleased to announce that the governor, the auditor general, and the adjutant general of the state have given their imprimatur 
to the contents of this volume. This approval of their labors is not only most gratifying to the authors, but adds to the authenticity of the work from the Regimental Committee on History. Epitome of Events, 1861-1862 An epitome of the rapidly forming events of 1861-1862, transpiring in western Pennsylvania up to the summer of 1862, when the youths composing the rank and file of the 155th Pennsylvania Regiment volunteered for the Union cause is believed to be a fitting introduction to the history of the campaigns of the regiment. In this chapter, therefore, will be found a summary of important events and incidents occurring in the nation and locally during the first year of the war. All western Pennsylvania had been aroused by certain acts and declarations of southern representatives in the closing days of 1860, so that when an order from the Secretary of War, John B. Floyd, was issued directing the shipment of heavy ordnance from the Allegheny Arsenal to distant points in the south for fortifications, the great indignation of the citizens of Pittsburgh was aroused. Already some of the canyon had been conveyed to the steamer Silver Wave at the Pittsburgh Wharf, when a public meeting was called and held in January 1861 on the courthouse grounds in Pittsburgh. It was a representative meeting of loyal citizens. Prompt action was taken in protesting against the removal of the cannons. James Buchanan, the President of the United States, had many warm, personal friends in western Pennsylvania, and in response to the demand of the citizens at this meeting at the courthouse, presided over by Dr. George McCook Sr., it was resolved that a formal protest should be telegraphed to the President. The telegram read as follows. James Buchanan, President of the United States. Sir, an order issued by the War Department to transfer the effective munitions of war from the arsenal in the city to the southern military posts has created great excitement in the public mind. We would advise that the order be immediately countermanded. We speak at the instance of the people, and if not done, cannot answer for the consequences. William Wilkins, William F. Johnston, Thomas Williams, Charles Shaler. On the receipt of this telegram, the President promptly countermanded Secretary Floyd's order for the removal of the cannon, and the excitement thereupon subsided. President-elect Lincoln in Pittsburgh On the evening of February 14, 1861, occurred another important event in the history of this period. This was the arrival from Springfield, Illinois, of Abraham Lincoln, President-elect en route to be inaugurated President of the United States. He was received at the Pittsburgh Fort Wayne and Chicago Rail Station on Federal Street, Allegheny City, by an immense multitude, anxious to see the man destined to fill the most important position in the most critical crisis of American nation for the four years to follow. On Smithfield Street, at the Monongahela House, the crush was so great that the military companies were required to clear the way for the presidential carriages. In response to loud and repeated calls for a speech, Mr. Lincoln stood upon a chair in the lobby of the hotel and begged to be excused from them, addressing the assemblage, declaring that he had promised the reception committee that he would have a few words to say to the public the next morning. He facetiously said, Some people think I am like a town pump, referring to the the persistent demands for a speech, that all that has to be done is to shake my hand and demand a speech and it will come like the water upon shaking the handle of the pump. The military, General James S. Nigley, in command, formed the presidential escort while the president was in the city. The next morning, fully 10,000 people gathered around the Monongahela House to hear Mr. Lincoln's promised speech from the portico of the hotel on Smithfield Street. His patriotic address on the occasion lasted but 15 minutes. It was remarkable, as was his subsequent address at Gettysburg, for its simple, easily understood utterances all appealing to his countrymen to act for the good of the country and to be true to the Constitution and the laws under which the nation is the providence of God has so prospered. This speech had a decided effect in enlightening the people of the whole country as to Mr. Lincoln's broad statesmanship 
and comprehension of the conditions confronting the nation at that time. The First Call to Arms With the dawn of real war caused by the firing of Sumter on April 13, 1861, the call to arms in western Pennsylvania was promptly sounded, and with Pittsburgh as the metropolis, nowhere else was there a quicker and heartier response. On the 15th of April, the President's first call to the states for 75,000 militia to serve for three months was issued. At that date, there were still living and active in the community many survivors of the Mexican War. And these men still preserved the martial spirit of veterans, and because of their military experience, they were among the first to volunteer in response to the call of the President. They were awarded with commissions and at once sent about organizing companies and regiments. Chief among those patriotic survivors of the Mexican War may be mentioned General James S. Negley, commanding the state militia of Allegheny County in 1860 and 1861, Colonel Thomas A. Rowley, Colonel Robert Anderson, Captain Alexander Hayes, Captain Oliver H. Rippey, Captain Samuel W. Black, and Captain Samuel a. McKee. Nor at that date had all the veterans of the War of 1812 passed away. Though incapacitated by age, these venerable patriots became enthusiastic and exerted patriotic influence by their language and loyal sentiment in support of the country's flag. Prompt Filling of Quota Soon regiments and companies were recruited and promptly placed at the disposal of the governor of the state in numbers far surpassing the quota of western Pennsylvania. This produced great rivalry in recruiting. The companies and regiments thus promptly recruited and mustered into service from Allegheny County and western Pennsylvania were all assigned to the army of General Robert Patterson of Philadelphia, a distinguished soldier of the Mexican War. The troops of this command were ordered by the government at Washington to remain at points in Pennsylvania, at York, and along the Northern Central Railroad to guard it from raids by bodies of the enemy in Maryland and Virginia, who frequently threatened the line of communication, the troops in Washington and at the front. This military experience, however, was beneficial in educating officers and men in the school of a soldier, and at the end of their term of service, these companies and regiments served as the nucleus to furnish numerous colonels and generals and officers of rank to regiments organized later to serve three years or during the war. As indicating the promptness of the responses, Colonel R.P. McDowell of Pittsburgh, with three companies, was mustered into the United States service on April 20th, 1861, and made Colonel of the 5th Regiment Pennsylvania Volunteers. From Sunday, April 14th, to Wednesday, April 24th, 1861, the record shows that there have been recruited, armed, and sent to the front from Allegheny County 2,000 volunteers, and that as many more had tendered their service to go on an hour's notice. Great War Mass Meeting The prompt action of the citizens of Pittsburgh on the news of the firing on Fort Sumpner was indicated by a mass meeting of the citizens of Allegheny County and vicinity, held at City Hall on the evening of April 15th, just two days after the fall of Sumner. The meeting was so largely attended that there was not space for all who applied for admission, and many hundreds were turned away. Honorable William Wilkins, who presided at the great mass meeting, had been a prominent Democrat and a friend of General Jackson. He was called from his retirement in the tranquility of his old age to preside at this great meeting, the intense ardor of his eloquent and patriotic appeal for the preservation of the Union had an electrical effect on the audience and exerted a lasting influence on the community. Colonel James P. Barr, editor of The Post, William Neeb of the Freiheit's Frund, Honorable Thomas J. Bigham, and James Park, Jr. were appointed to draft resolutions on the state of the country. At this great mass meeting, addresses of great force and eloquence were also made by Honorable Thomas M. Marshall, Honorable P. C. Shannon, Honorable A. W. Loomis, Honorable Robert McKnight, Dr. E. D. Gazam, Ex-Governor William F. Johnston, and Marshall Schwarzweiler. 
the resolutions read by Colonel James P. Barr, Chairman of the Committee on Resolutions, and unanimously adopted at the mass meeting, pledged to support of the people of the community without regard to party to President Lincoln's administration in support of the laws and constitution of the United States and the preservation of the Union until the great rebellion against the government should be suppressed. Judge Wilkins, as chairman, announced the Committee of Public Safety, whose duty, among other objects, was declared to be to keep a sharp lookout for traitors. The following citizens constituted the Committee of Public Safety, who throughout the entire period of the war devoted their time and means unremittingly to the patriotic duties of the times. The names and memories of every one of these loyal citizens deserves to be perpetrated in the history of the country as examples of devoted patriotism. This is a, a very long list of names, so I'm just going to pick five at random. They were making it in. Everyone else is getting cut, uh, but I'll put it down in the show notes. John Wright. J.W. Barker. Robert Finley. George A. Berry. And Edward Gregg. Seems like a good name to make it in. Organization of Committee of Public Safety. The Committee of Public Safety, thus appointed by Judge Wilkins, promptly organized by the selection of General Thomas M. Howe as chairman. General Howe had been for many years one of the most prominent and successful businessmen of Pittsburgh. He entered upon the active duties of the position, which became so absorbing as to take up his entire time so that his private business was turned over to others. As the war progressed, General Howe's duties as chairman of the Committee of Public Safety was very much increased. In his strenuous labors throughout the four years of the war, he presented the highest type of patriotism. As long as a veteran of the Civil War or his descendants survives in Allegheny County, the memory of this esteemed and patriotic citizen should be cherished for his great services to the Union cause. The various subcommittees of the Committee of Public Safety were quickly organized. The Executive Committee, Committee on Transit of Munitions of War, Committee on Support of Volunteers Not Yet Accepted by the Government, Committee for the Aid of Families of Volunteers, and later the Substance Committee. Under the supervision of this Committee of Public Safety, Allegheny's quota of volunteers was speedily raised in answer to President Lincoln's first call for 75,000 men. This was the beginning of the Committee of Public Safety's activity in aid of the Union cause. Not only did the city and county furnish soldiers for the war, but during the entire period, the manufacturers, merchants, and the banks of the city aided the government in supplying equipment, clothing, food, and money. On April 17, 1861, the Board of Bank Presidents sent a telegram to the governor stating that the banks of Pittsburgh will cheerfully respond to the call for money to meet the late appropriation to be used in enabling the government to sustain the Constitution and the laws. Services of Pennsylvania Railroad Simultaneous with these early events should be mentioned the patriotic part and prompt service rendered by the Pennsylvania Railroad Company to the cause of the Union. J. Edgar Thompson was president of the railroad. Thomas A. Scott was vice president. And Andrew Carnegie was serving as a superintendent of the Pittsburgh Division at the special request of the Honorable Simon Cameron. Secretary of War, Vice President Scott was asked to report in Washington to place the railroad and telegraph lines in proper condition and control to cooperate with military movements and to meet all emergencies. At Colonel Scott's request, Andrew Carnegie was detailed to accompany and assist Colonel Scott in this branch of the work. This was early in April 1861, and Mr. Carnegie was placed first in charge of the United States Military Telegraph Corps with headquarters at Alexandria, Virginia. Mr. Carnegie's organized and operated this military telegraph department until November 1861, establishing it on so firm a basis and putting it in such thorough working order that, at President Thompson's request, 
He was relieved and returned to duty as superintendent of the railroad for the Western Division of Pittsburgh. The transportation of troops and military supplies for the vast armies in the field had so increased and become so of paramount importance to the railroad company and to the nation that Mr. Carnegie was called upon to discharge the strenuous duties of the position. On this important duty, he served during the remainder of 1861 and throughout 1862, discharging the difficult duties of the position so successfully as to merit the highest encomiums of the officials of the railroad company and also of the government. The record of this period will establish beyond a doubt that no official of the government rendered greater service to the cause of the Union than did Mr. Carnegie by the extraordinary foresight in the prompt transportation of troops and supplies to the points of the Army activities. His great services as organizer and first chief of the United States Military Telegraph Corps were of vital importance to military campaigns. They are the matter of history, and the value of that corps to the Army in the field cannot be overestimated. It may be well to mention in this connection the prompt and efficient service of Robert Pitkern, superintendent of the Altoona Division of the Pennsylvania Railroad. Union Mass Meetings During 1861 and the spring of 1862, war meetings continued to be held nightly in Pittsburgh, Allegheny, and the vicinity. Lecturers became public advocates for the Union. Ministers and lawyers went on the platform to plead the cause of the country. Many halls and rooms were rented for meetings. Henry Ward Beecher of New York was one of the earliest of these war orators in the country, and later he was appointed to visit Great Britain, there to deliver Union orations to the English people. After him came Professor Amasa McCoy of the Smithsonian Institute, an orator of national reputation who spoke at a great mass meeting in the Opera House at Pittsburgh. Many other orators of the national fame delivered stirring addresses for the Union in all of the large cities. Clergymen preached patriotic sermons. Teachers caught the inspiration. Everybody anxiously awaited events that came all too soon and all too sad. And with that ominous ending, we're going to wrap up here for today and pick up again in the next episode. I was particularly impressed that so many committees were formed in this reading. It's nice to know that the party planning committee has roots in American history. Um, one quick note, all of my episodes are going to be formatted with an intro song and then go straight into the book reading. Because I found myself getting annoyed with other podcasts that I were listening to that the longer they went on, the longer their intros kept getting before they would like just get to the meat of the content that I wanted to listen to. So for um, my episodes, at least, they will all be done this way. So if you don't care, as soon as the episode's over, you can just dip out and uh, go on with your day. But if you still want to listen, you can just hang out for a little bit. Uh, the next episode I'm probably going to record tomorrow but I'm not going to post until um, the 10th of April. But if you're a Patreon subscriber, I will have another episode coming out on the 1st. But this particular Patreon episode will be for everyone, so that everyone can see what my Patreon content will be like. Um, the episodes uh, can be similar in length, longer or shorter, uh, maybe focused on a particular passage of a novel or a poem or maybe a song, or even food-related. Or even the reading of another Civil War era novel, or a book. I've got a bunch of ideas that I want to share with you guys. So, if, Also, if you haven't, please check out my website at rebellionstories.com and my YouTube channel, which still doesn't have anything on it, but hopefully it does by the time you're looking at this, which is on uh, Leon Meowsers. For... Um, more Civil War content and live streams is what I plan on having on that YouTube channel. With that, my friends, good day, my good night, and until next time. Sleep in his faded coat of blue, in a lonely grave alone,
find a heart that beats so true. They will find him and know him amongst the good and true. When a robe of white is given for that faded coat of blue, no more the bugle calls the weary one. Rest, noble spirit, in thy grave alone. They will find you and know you amongst the good and true. When a robe of white is given for that faded coat of blue, he cried, Give me water and just one little crumb, and my mother, she will bless you through all the years to come. Go tell my sweet sister, so gentle, good, and true, that I'll meet her up in heaven or in my faded coat of blue. No more the bugle calls the weary one. Rest, noble spirit, in thy grave alone. They will find you and know you amongst the good and true. When a robe of white is given for that faded 